Good afternoon, those who are in Europe, and good morning, those who some of you are in other continents, maybe uh, Canada, USA, uh, and other countries. Uh, today, we continue the series of Eden webinars, dedicating to discuss the challenges that all of us are facing in time of pandemics. The series of Eden webinars have been greatly recognized by academic community uh, because they allow us to rediscuss the most emerging issues, to stay online together, and uh, to prepare, to, to take our time to prepare for action in shaping uh, higher education uh, 4.0. So you can follow this series of webinars uh, regularly through Eden uh, social media and communication channels. The three decades of uh, actually serving of modernization in education in Europe has been dedicated in European distance and e-learning network. And we are very happy now to share this experience with all participants of the webinars. Today's webinar is dedicated uh, to the topic that is one of the most urgent topics as demonstrated the discussions among academics and professionals in Europe and the global world. And we raise a question today for ourselves and for the participants of the webinar, do we develop digital competences or digital skills? The reference of our webinar today is Digcom Edu framework, digitally competent educator framework that actually helped us to balance our way through the storm. The webinar was based uh, on the story that started in 2017 when Digcom Edu framework was introduced in Europe, in Europe for education institutions, helping all of us to identify the main areas of digital competences for educators, despite of the fact which level they represented, school, adult, vet, or higher education. In recent years, we witnessed ourselves how important DigComp Edu served to keep the balance for us as consultants, as experts, as teacher trainers, as professors in higher education during the pandemic storm. There is even a more pressing need to operationalize existing competence models and to clarify how we have used them, how it is used now, and how it may be used by education organizations in Europe and beyond. Competence framework is another keyword in our webinar. We still remember in Europe discussions taking place in 2004, 6, and 8 in the framework of tuning academy, in competence framework, in bed uh, discussions, in Kaloya for higher education that describe the competence elements, knowledge, skills, attitudes, responsibilities. These frameworks are very well forgotten. And from time to time, we need to come back to them to reinvestigate the application of the new models in line with existing ones that served for decades. Another fact is that there are brilliant proposals by European projects funded by the European Commission in Europe that bring already their proposals and ideas on how to develop competence frameworks further on. Finally, we need to readdress the models to see how these developments still argue for teacher, but also for student agency, and not only in Europe, but on the global world. So these questions, these discussions brought us together today for the webinar. Uh, we have prepared several polls for you while we will be introducing ourselves to you. Before that even, we would like to ask you, what is the biggest need that you, as participants of today's webinar, as educators, 
experience in digital competence development. Could we please open the poll for the participants now? Please choose the challenge that you experience most. Finding digital competence development programs, creating digital resources for teaching and learning, teaching and learning process, assessment in digital learning, empowering learners, developing learner digital competence. Please use one of these. Let's have five more seconds for your choices. I hope everyone could answer the poll. And count down five, four, three, two, one. Please show us the results. So we see that creating digital resources for teaching and learning and assessment in digital learning raised the highest challenges for you. Let's see how they will be addressed in today's webinar. Finally, I'm very happy after this introduction to introduce the speakers, the panel members of today's webinar. First of all, I would like to introduce Anastasia Konomo, who works at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. She's leading Selfie for Teachers, the self-reflection tool based on the European framework for the digital competence of educators and Beach Comp Edu project. She led a number of projects in teachers, continuous professional development and learning, uh, working at Cyprus Pedagogical Institute. I'm also very happy to introduce our global speaker today in this panel, who is Dr. Nicole Johnson, Research Director at the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. Her research focuses on the tracking and development of digital learning at the national level. I'm very happy to introduce European team from EDICO project, represented here by the coordinator Jochen Ehrenreich from DHBW Cooperative State University of Baden-Württemberg. His research focuses on higher education strategy adaptation to micro-credentials and online learning. Dr. Yasmin Diabarian, Program Manager at Stifterverband in Berlin. Her work focuses on digitally supported teaching, student participation, and innovation processes in higher education. And last but not the least, Stefano Menon, from Project Manager at Fondazione Politecnico di Milano. His focus is on innovation of didactics, working transversely with different target groups from kindergarten to higher education and lifelong learning. My name is Irina Volongavicine. I am the president of Peer Digital Learning and also I come from Beatles Magnus University in Lithuania and work together with this team in a wonderful EDICO project. So let's start our short presentations and I would like to invite Jochen to introduce the first uh, and very important EDICO approach using DigiCompedu to support the development and certification of the digital competence of educators, EDICO approach. Please Jochen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina. I will share my screen. So I will uh, give you a short overview on the um, EDICO project. Uh, the title is Supported Development and Certification of the Digital Competences of Educators. And here you can see the project partners. It is an Erasmus Plus uh, uh, project uh, co-funded by the European Union. And we have partners in Germany, Malta, Finland, Lithuania, Italy, and Spain. And we have uh, three project aims. The first is that we will we are, have created a learning maturity model for digital education competence that we are presenting in this webinar and discussing with you. And uh, then based on this learning maturity model, we will uh, create a self-assessment and recommendation tool for digital competences of educators. And this tool will then recommend um, learning opportunities for educators. So uh, uh, we, we are also creating a directory of learning opportunities 
uh, for digital education. And the challenge that we are facing there is actually, um, or what we are discussing is, should all the competences actually be open in a way that they are free, or should we include fee-based offerings as well? So to um, get a first overview on the, uh, the topic, we uh, conducted interviews um, with educators and asked them, what do they need? What do they want? What do they use? How do they learn? How do, you, do they develop their uh, digital competences? How they, do they relate to digital tools? And are they familiar with digital competence frameworks? Most of them are not familiar with digital competence frameworks. And um, we found out that we should uh, focus on informal short learning opportunities because teachers are reluctant to enroll in uh, CPD courses due to lack of time and lack of uh, incentives. Instead, they prefer learning by doing or problem-based learning, collaborative uh, learning, self-training. As an example, a university professor from Germany said, when I take a formal CPD course, then I still have to do the same amount of teaching. So my to-do list just gets longer. This is why I carefully judge whether I actually need this CPD course or not. Already now, I know how I could improve my teaching, but this would require that I put more time and effort into it, which I cannot afford to, afford to do because I have other obligations. However, educators do see their, uh, uh, the potential of uh, digitization and the transformative power it has. So they um, <clears throat> are curious of the possibilities and uh, are very well aware that it affects all university roles, teachers, administration, and students. And um, then I hand over to Stefano to tell us what we actually, which competences we added to the DigiComp Edu framework. Thank you, Jochen. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, you should see now my screen. Well, uh, let me say, first of all, uh, good afternoon to all of you and good, good morning also, because I'm happy to see that also some people from the Americas have joined. So it's it's, it's hard time for you for in the early morning. And uh, I will start from a Jochen presentation to create this link uh, for, for my, my speech, because uh, I think, uh, well, it's important to say that the interviews were carried out, most of them before the pandemic. And uh, uh, the answers that we received, uh, maybe now if we are going to uh, interview the same people after uh, one year and a half could have changed because obviously the pandemic has increased the interest and the uh, approach uh, to the digital learning to, for, for most of, um, of the teachers. So it would be interesting to, to, to make this check. But what was, in, was um, interesting for us was to, to have the confirmation that, that there was a, a, a break between uh, the, the, uh, the tools that are available, the frameworks that are available in the, in the organization of the, of the competencies for the, uh, for the development of, of digital competences of the educators and of the teachers, and the, uh, the ways that teachers used to uh, select uh, uh, supporting materials to, to get introduced and trained. Uh, so uh, somehow EDICO is going to try to uh, uh, find a, a systematic approach to, uh, to this, um, let me say, problem uh, or uh, issue that uh, is, regards uh, the link between uh, the, the actual level of uh, uh, competencies and uh, the, the expected one. 
But back to us, the first point of our project was to uh, make a kind of selection of, uh, of the competencies that uh, should be taken into account uh, for the creation of the uh, supporting uh, materials that will come later. And uh, we decided to create this kind of, this kind of competence meta model. We obviously started from the um, uh, the Compedu, but we went through a lot of other competent, uh, competence frameworks that we have been able to select during uh, uh, our uh, project activities, we made a comparison. And uh, based on this, we found out uh, that uh, some competencies could be of interest for the, for the teachers, also if uh, actually not already uh, present in the, in the, um, uh, the competitive. We obviously started from this uh, structure. And... Uh, uh, Obviously, I have to, to rush so we don't go too, too much in the deep, but you have uh, the possibility to um, access these resources directly from the website. And I think Irina already shared uh, the link to the resource. So now I go very fast. Uh, when we uh, work on the Decompedio, then we uh, had to make a selection of the main uh, le proficiency levels that we could use in order to make it uh, feasible for uh, um, a matching with the, with the learning tools. And uh, um, we, we arrived to a, a report that, were, that is also available in the, in the, in the project EDICO website, uh, where you can find all the comparisons between the decomped framework and all the other frameworks that we have been able to, to analyze. Moving from this, we arrived to our proposal. We, we want to stress the fact that this proposal is not a revision of the, the Compedu. We don't, we don't mean to do such a complex uh, uh, activity. Uh, our aim is to um, increase the possibility of the Decompedu to uh, have uh, direct links to the uh, supporting materials, uh, to the um, supporting programs that can uh, obviously support teachers in, in, the, in the acquisition of, of their uh, competencies. And uh, we arrived to this new uh, proposal uh, where we have added some uh, potential competencies. Here you can't see very well, but if I move to this one, you see in, in bold, there are some uh, new uh, bullets, and uh, this is our proposal. And in, what is interesting is that uh, we uh, selected uh, health as a, a very important area that was not fully covered, in our opinion, uh, by the actual uh, uh, framework. And this was done also before the pandemic. And uh, I th we think as well that uh, uh, with the pandemic, uh, the um, importance of the health uh, competencies related is, uh, has, has increased its, its visibility and, and importance with some other uh, competencies that have been described in this simple way for each uh, uh, competence, we have uh, selected the three main uh, uh, levels. You see, we didn't choose uh, all the six levels, but this is explained later by uh, our, my colleague, uh, because then we are going to create a matrix that is going to make it more complex. But anyway, uh, we decided to, to create very short and clear sentences that somehow are should be coherent with uh, the actual descriptions of the uh, decompedio. And all this work should be then uh, used uh, for the realization of the output two and then output three when we're going to, to select the related uh, teaching uh, resources. I don't know how much time I, I have, but maybe I can, for example, just 
stop on one of the of these uh, uh, competencies. For example, please, can, uh, please, it's very interesting. I think. Uh, okay, so I can use uh, micro credentialization. That is uh, a, a a competence. We we think it's it's a competence that is increasing in terms of, of importance. We know that uh, micro credential in the last years have become very, very important, always more popular, and most of all, uh, very effective in relation to the uh, market needs, to the needs of the trainees that have to uh, get trained on uh, new competencies that were not existing or available before, new uh, mix of competencies that were not, uh, were not thought before and uh, micro credentialization somehow is going to answer also to these uh, to these questions so uh, are teachers able to design badges credentials that contain all the available information to facilitate the recognition of intermediate achievement maybe yes or not we, we have selected the, the three main levels and we suppose that a, a basic level a teacher should be able to use the existing systems to, to issue digital credentials. Designing the micro credentials on the levels of micro and micro curriculum and the links and the metadata between the credential and the digital curriculum in a virtual learning environment. So this is, should be the uh, more simple activity uh, that should be able to manage teachers. But then when we improve the competence, maybe we should be able to use and explain credentializing systems to design and issue digital credentials, consulting on the process of designing digital credentials and peer reviewing micro credentials developed on the micro and micro curriculum level, and reviewing as well as updating the metadata for credential on learning outcomes, assessment methods, EQF levels, and so on. Uh, from IT systems such as the digital curriculum uh, in a virtual learning environment. And uh, the last level, uh, so uh, the pioneer should be able to create and implement a digital micro-credential strategy for the organization. So we are, uh, it should be a competence that is able to look, look forward for the, the new need that are, are, are arising from, from the market and from the digitalization of, the, of our society. Aligning the assess assessment strategy with digital credentializing, uh, designing a curriculum in a way that individual elements or modules can be issued as micro-credential and that outside uh, credentials can be recognized towards this curriculum. Also, this is a very important point, the, the um, possibility to create new mix of, of uh, activities and recognitions. Training colleagues in designing micro-credential on the levels of micro and, uh, and micro curriculum level and preparing the metadata for the credential, supplying um, from uh, IT systems uh, such as a digital curriculum in a virtual learning environment. Okay. This is, uh, a typical description that we have uh, created for all the new uh, competencies. But we know also that uh, some of the competencies that have, we have selected um, uh, don't find everybody uh, um, on the same position. So uh, I would ask to our uh, Eden uh, manager if uh, you can launch the, the poll where we want to ask you which of the competencies that have been uh, selected in this uh, meta model uh, by EDICO as additional proposal to the, um, the COMPETU are uh, for, for, in your opinion, to be, to be added. I think I have to uh, interrupt my presentation, okay? Thank you, Stefano, very much. Please, uh, could we have the second poll for participants of the webinar? So you see now the question that Stefano asked, please indicate your preference, gamification, micro-credentialization, recognition, agile working, health, well-being, being safe and legal online, active learning, artificial intelligence, Please cast your votes. 
Five, four, three, two, one, and uh, we would like to see the results. Stefano? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, my fear was that uh, gamification <laughs> at like a zero score, but I see that some of you selected gamification, so I'm very happy for this. And um, active learning uh, <laughs> is the is one of the the, the competence that is, is the most selected competence is uh, it's not strange but let me say um, it, we it's not it doesn't be had it at the end but not because it's, we thought it is not important but because it was already somehow available in another subset of competencies in the decompet but uh, this uh, uh, it's good for us to see that also for, for other people in this panel uh, was a, a, an important competence. And uh, then I see that um, uh, many of them have been selected, so I'm happy to see that somehow uh, there is a, a good score for, uh, for each of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano, indeed. Um, so we had uh, several proposals already for the measurement of maturity of competences, uh, of course, on the basis of DigiComp Edu uh, initial uh, uh, measurement uh, technique of maturity. But now we will have a very interesting proposal uh, introduced by Yasmin uh, Diabarian uh, from Stifterverband. Uh, on learning maturity model for DigiComp Edu. And I would like to pay your attention uh, that this um, reference is exactly the reference to the competence concept and definition used in Europe and recently in Kaloya Academy. Please, Yasmin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina. Um, hello, everyone. I'm happy to take over and introduce you to our learning maturity model for digital education competence. Um, <laughs> and um, as the meta model that Stefano just introduced, um, the learning maturity model is also part of Etico's project phase one, um, in which we are creating an organizational paradigm for digital education training content, content which will then um, serve as the foundation for Etico's central output, the learning directory um, for quality, high quality digital education training content. So maybe that's just as a quick reminder um, where we are um, set in the project and um, where the learning maturity model is located. Um, on a very um, yeah, basic level, you could say that um, the learning maturity model sets out to further operationalize Digicom Edu um, by breaking the competence dimensions down into um, the three categories or as you may, learning domains um, of knowledge, skills and autonomy responsibility, um, which we refer to as attitudes. Um, and of course, uh, maybe as a side note, and as uh, Stefano already mentioned, um, it also sets out to extend Digicom Edu in the sense that we've um, we've added those four new competence subsets and um, one entirely new uh, competence dimension. By breaking the um, competence dimensions down into those three categories, um, we um, you or by doing that we use the um, Kelohi competence structure as Irina just mentioned, and also um, the structure that's been used in the um, European Qualifications Framework for Lifelong Learning (EQF), and um, we propose and they propose um, gener generic competence levels for digital education competence. By aligning our um, our structure to Kalohi QF, we um, we pursued to um, or we try to ensure a compatibility with existing work. And um, for example, as as done in the tuning Kalohi frameworks, for example, on um, for teacher education and. Um, on all the while, um, of course, acknowledging that, for example, Kalohi provides um, an overview of whole subject areas and um, uh, is therefore yeah, based on a progressional paradigm for bachelor's, master's, doctorates. Um, and our ethical progression paradigm is based on continuing professional training for educators. 
Uh, maybe as another info or um, explanation, what did we mean with knowledge or what do we mean with knowledge, skills and attitudes? Um, for us, we um, also use the EQF definitions, um, Kalohi definitions. So knowledge is theoretical and, um, and or factual knowledge skills is the application of knowledge can be both cognitive or um, practical and I think a very, um, and we all agree in the consortium, a very, um, a very important, essential um, category. Also, the attitudes um, category, or as also known, responsibility and autonomy, uh, which refers to the ability to um, apply knowledge and skills autonomously and also with responsibility. And um, we went, um, as has been done in other places, I might <laughs> have to add, um, we we went with the for us more aptly, um, more apt term at attitudes. Um, I think the proficiency levels, um, Stefano has already touched upon a little, um, we, apart from the dimensions and the learning domains, we also structure the learning maturity model according to three proficiency levels. Um, we've, we've used the scriptures that have been used at, um, in Digcom Edu, but, and as has been mentioned, to try to, in order to try to reduce complexity and allow us to make the matching of the, um, the learning maturity model, learning outcomes and the learning resources, the digital learning opportunities more feasible, we went with the three, um, the three proficiency levels you see on the bottom, explorer, expert and pioneer. Um, here you can see a screenshot of the learning maturity model. It's um, dimension one, professional engagement, subset one. And um, just to give you a little idea um, what our model looks like. And all together, we've, um, uh, the model consists of, uh, I looked it up, 261 cells. And um, <laughs> so uh, we have 29 competence subsets. And then for each of um each of them, we have uh, three um, three uh, categories, smart skills and um, attitudes, as well as three proficiency levels. Um, the main work of the matrix has been done by the Ethical Consortium. Of course, as has been mentioned, it needs to be uh, re-emphasized heavily based on Digcom Edu. Um, but we've also tried at various stages of the process to include stakeholders and to also um, yeah, uh, get, in, get um, active in the Digcom Edu community of practice. And we're also planning several stakeholder online stakeholder workshops and we'll um, upload a feedback form shortly on our website where we would like to invite, of course, all of you to, um, to uh, submit um, feedback and get involved in the validation process. And I would stop right here and hand over to Nicole. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Yes, indeed. Um, now we come to the moment when we invite our global partner, Nicole Johnson from Canada, uh, Digital Learning Research Association. As you see, this uh, webinar is, has a lot of uh, shadows of research and we go quite deep into the concept of competence. But we also had a very interesting discussion in preparation to the webinar and Nicole's uh, ideas were shared with us uh, on how the pandemic highlighted the need to develop digital competences and not only among teachers, right, Nicole? Please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, perfect. I'll just share my screen here. There we go. Okay, so everyone should see uh, this here. So one of the things that I've been doing over here is I've been involved in about, oh, I'd say more than 10, I think it's 12 different research studies since the start of the pandemic. So it has been a very, very busy year and a bit. And in these studies, which were done through the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, where I'm the research director, Bayview Analytics in the United States, where I'm a research associate, and then also Royal Roads University, where I work uh, as well. And I was delighted to be asked to be part of this panel today because what I've been seeing in my research has really highlighted the need 
for digital uh, competence development. So to get into that, we see it among teachers, but we also see it among students. And in this slide, I've shared a quote from a senior administrator in Canada. And this is part of our one of our reports that we put together. And I had interviewed um, uh, provosts and BP academics in Canada in the fall of 2020 and asking them what were their most pressing needs, what were they seeing going on in their campuses. And one of the things that I heard several times was this discovery that uh, students who we assume have grown up with technology and have these proficiencies did not necessarily have the skills that are needed to learn with technology. So in a sense, they know how to create a TikTok video. They know how to text with their friends or interact with their friends on social media. However, that doesn't necessarily transfer to the skill of being able to engage with uh, a professor online or to have a meaningful discussion with classmates, um, either asynchronously or synchronously. And so that's very important to keep in mind as we are developing this is it's not just a need amongst instructors and professors and faculty, but students need this too. So in many ways, we're going to find that instructors are going to probably need to play some sort of a mentorship role in helping students navigate uh, this new demand for digital. And as we'll see, um, it's likely that the digital needs are going to increase over time. Um, in faculty, and this is looking at a bird's eye view of all the different research studies that I've done, um, we saw that faculty very noticeably experienced that steep learning curve at the onset of the pandemic. We saw faculty feeling overwhelmed, uh, stressed out. Many faculty were teaching online for the very first time. So prior to the pandemic, the research that was done showed that a minority of faculty had experience with online teaching, but there were many people who said, oh, I don't need to learn that. That's, that's for the people who like teaching online. I don't need to know about that. And that all changed in March of 2020. In Canada especially, a lot of the institutions provided professional development over the summer months. So we had a semester that was an intense learning, a rapid transition to um, what we refer to as emergency remote teaching, which was delivered online. But in the Canadian context, we knew, um, many institutions knew by June going into summer that they were going to continue the 2020-2021 academic year online. So they provided or recommended a lot of professional development. And one of the things I heard in my interviews from senior administrators was that there was an unprecedented uptake. So faculty were very interested in learning how to teach online effectively. And then what we saw when we interviewed faculty in the fall is that the majority of them felt prepared to teach online. Interestingly, any type of professional development was good pro professional development. We asked them about the professional development that they took, whether it was having access to an online resource hub or um, having mentorship, being part of a community of practice, attending webinars or having asynchronous um, materials that they could engage in. Any type of that was ranked as effective and with a very little margin of difference in terms of what was, in other words, nothing was more or less effective than the others from what we could see. It's also important to note that along with developing um, digital competences, to recognize that some faculty may also experience barriers with access to technologies. So we do need to, um, we cannot assume that faculty will necessarily have a computer at home that would support their needs, that they would have the internet capabilities that they would need, or at least in Canada, that's what we saw. And that was in major cities as well as remotely. So the last main slide I wanna share is just illustrating the importance 
of having these discussions about the development of digital competences in the fact that it's very likely we're going to see increased technology over time. So this, what we we did a pre-survey of institutions in Canada prior to doing our major um, national survey. And one of the questions we asked was we gave them a selection and we asked them what was the likelihood, whether they agreed it would be likely over the next 12 months for a series of items. So we saw, as you can see from the chart, that there's there's a trend towards digital. So whether it's hybrid offerings, whether it's um, having a greater use of digital technology um, in class, whether it's a greater use of digital materials, the the only thing that we we don't see as being likely is fewer online offerings. And from the qualitative data that I've engaged in, what I see or that I've engaged with is I've seen most a trend towards hybrid learning. Uh, we see that at the student level in the U.S. as well. Um, we see it at the faculty level in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, people do not want to be uh, forced into either only in person or only in line. What we're seeing is a trend towards people wanting choices now that they've had the opportunity to experience learning online and having that like flexibility. So before I hand it over, I've got um, I've got a couple links where I do have the publications to, uh, that have come out of the research that I've done, and I'll pop those in the chats, um, the chat box in a moment, and then I also have my email if anyone's interested in that further research. And so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back. Thank you very much, Nicole. Please post the links to the chat as they're not available through the um, big window in, 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 in the center. So we had uh, a couple of brief presentations. I, I also took all the questions that uh, were uh, arising from the chat and also questions and answers window, and we will come to them uh, in a very uh, few minutes. But uh, now I would like to invite uh, Anastasia, economic economist from Joint Research Center, to reflect uh, on what uh, you've heard uh, from the proposals and, and ideas expressed. But also we're very keen to know what is um, happening, uh, how uh, Digcom Ed develops, and uh, we know that you don't wait uh, for some proposals but to move further. So please, Anastasia, the floor is yours, and we are really waiting for your information and uh, ideas. Uh, thank you, Irina. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, interesting panel and provide some first reflections uh, to initiate the discussion by the participants, I hope. Uh, it's of great importance uh, for us at JRC uh, and then Digcom Edu team to listen how the framework has been implemented and used in different contexts. Uh, projects like uh, EDICO can provide uh, very useful insights for us <laughs> and of course suggestions as uh, colleagues here mentioned on how to pro progress uh, collectively uh, they work done, and um, of course, to think about the next steps uh, on, on which come do. Um, and um, actually, this is the purpose of uh, of which come do as a competence framework to provide a common reference for educators' digital competence. And as such, um, we see in which come do to serve. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, ID a reference uh, framework to to serve uh, training in service and initial uh, teachers education programs, development of educational resources uh, like um, uh, you're doing already guidelines uh, for teacher qualification and so on. Um, I mean, the great the framework operationalization, as Serena mentioned, is uh, quite wide. And could be it would be of great value to to see all these uh, ideas and suggestions, as I said, to guide us uh, through uh, next steps. Um, as already mentioned by many of you, the framework has been published back in 2017, and since then uh, a few things have changed, not only in relation to technology, but also in relation to digital competences and policy measures. 
Um, the recent pandemic uh, forced many education systems to turn to online teaching, and uh, as Nicole mentioned as well, uh, this uh, emergency remote teaching. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, to be able to respond to this um, uh, urgency, um, some teachers or schools uh, or systems were not uh, fully prepared. Uh, as we know also from uh, OCT, OCD study recently. Um, I, I need to mention that um, uh, now uh, at the JRC, at the European Commission, uh, we are developing uh, a, a self-reflection tool uh, to support teachers to uh, identify their needs and um, gaps, but also strengths in order to further develop. It's, uh, I need to say here that it's not a self-assessment uh, in terms uh, of a tool that can lead into uh, certification as the one that uh, you're, you're discussing about, but um, a tool that uh, will uh, guide uh, teachers uh, through a, a journey to design their own learning paths towards their professional development. And um, uh, Nicole mentioned how important it is to have uh, in-person personalized learning experiences. So we'd like to encourage teachers to take the initiative to uh, design their own learning paths. And of course, um, if, uh, uh, if uh, they would like to, to share the anonymous data that they have in order to a help a group of teachers, maybe that would be the school, a region, or an institution, to and uh, design uh, training programs, material, and so on. But as Stefano says, um, uh, new trends, new pedagogical needs, the pandemic uh, as well, um, uh, showed us that we need to consider uh, uh, competences that are there in the, in the framework, but maybe we'd like them to be more prominent uh, in this effort. So developing a tool um, uh, is, is a process that we did, not to revise the framework, of course, it's, uh, as you said, it's a very complex and long <laughs> uh, process that um, involves a lot of stakeholders, experts, validation process, but uh, that was not the, um, the scope of the tool, um, but uh, for the tool, we try to put um, uh, into relevance uh, what is there in the framework for teachers to be able to self-reflect. And um, uh, in, in uh, collaboration with experts as well, we developed 32 items reflecting the six areas and 22 competences from the framework. And we just finished the pilot, uh, and um, actually the pilot uh, uh, confirmed uh, the 32 items in relation to the six areas and competences of the framework. Um, of course, uh, our real question is uh, whether uh, both the framework, but also this self-reflection tool uh, contributes significantly to the development of digital competence for teachers. Uh, of this, uh, we cannot really answer it. It would take uh, some time <laughs> and we need to, to measure this impact. But however, we can already draw some useful conclusions of what kind of other supportive actions can uh, be there to facilitate uh, teachers and uh, in order to further develop. Uh, so I think that um, the suggestions that we heard uh, um, and also what your uh, mentioning about uh, the certification, this self-assessment approach with problem solving, or even um, the, the material, the resources are organized, curated into the areas of the, of the framework. Actually, in the um, uh, focus group discussions with the piloting teachers, uh, they mentioned how important it was for them to receive an individual feedback by the tool with um, uh, specific uh, suggestions how to level up. So in the mission, how important it would be for them to link these suggestions to specifically. And so your work is very relevant and uh, we're looking forward uh, to the next steps uh, for you uh, as well. 
I, I hope uh, these initial uh, thoughts and insights um, uh, are helpful to, to discuss me further with the participants. Thank you, and congratulations for the work done. Anastasia, I would like to ask a question that we received from a participant because I think uh, that you already are on the way in answering it. <laughs> Mark Kava from Africa actually asks uh, a question if um, African context where online instructional strategies are at infantry stage, how can experts change the negative attitudes of instructors and students regarding digital teaching? My question to you would be the new tool that uh, you are developing and uh, assisting teachers to identify uh, themselves in digital uh, uh, framework uh, levels, maybe maturity levels, maybe areas of competences. Do you think that could be uh, a, a, a kind of support for teachers in order to change their attitude, to recognize maybe a little bit of their competences and start uh, being more confident with themselves? Would that tool help um, uh, to change the negative attitude towards positive thinking? What do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I mean, that's uh, the aim of the tool, to support and facilitate uh, teachers and, of course, uh, to, to have a tool that is relevant to different profiles of teachers, uh, both the ones that they feel a bit um, unsecure, but also the ones who are feel more confident. Uh, the, this tool uh, aims at um, uh, primary and secondary education teachers for now. So uh, it aims at this um, uh, group of teachers. And uh, we believe that by uh, providing the teacher uh, with the um, opportunity to decide on what kind of professional development, professional le learning needs, uh, it's very important. So the, the tool actually uh, allows a teacher at any point of time, I mean, maybe I'm a teacher in, uh, in Africa, North Africa, South Africa, maybe I'm a teacher in Europe, Canada, that I would like to see because of certain uh, needs that I have uh, for my teaching, to see what kind of um, um, uh, competences I need to develop. So I can initiate the self-reflection on my own, uh, go through it, get the feedback report, and get suggestions how to, to level up. At the same time, maybe a group of teachers um, want to um, identify uh, their needs as a group. And a group, as I said, could be a, a school, could be a region, it could be maybe a subject-specific uh, um, uh, group. So they, the teachers there, they take uh, their individual self-reflections and, um, and they agree to share their anonymous data. So the aggregate data can uh, reinforce the design of, uh, of uh, training material or even training programs. And actually, this was also mentioned as um, uh, an important point for teachers in the piloting countries that uh, it provided that to provide also this collaborative approach for learning, the professional learning, which is quite important for teachers, uh, as we know also from Thales. So um, I do hope that uh, we will succeed to uh, motivate teachers, and as I said, to be relevant for different profiles of teachers that we have. Thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe, Irina, I should uh, mention here that um, uh, because um, I think Nicole was mentioning about higher education uh, educators as well, that we, we have um, a, a tool as well for higher education that we are currently uh, used with Spanish universities. So in case uh, there is some interest, we can also provide some information there. And also that on the 16th of June, we will have a webinar presenting the, this new tool. So I will paste in the chat uh, some links for you to uh, to, to reach. Thank you. And uh, I have a, a very much related uh, question with that uh, from the audience, but also from, uh, from um, our panel members. But maybe I would ask Jochen, uh, but also any, any other who would like to respond. When actually our digital competences expire, 
what factors uh, influence uh, successful teaching and learning when you are or are not digitally competent, when your competences are recognized? What else, uh, Jochen, would you like to reflect on that? Well, there has been a discussion in Germany about the expiration of credentials and competence uh, uh, certification. And the answer is they never, it, they never expire legally. So uh, the question is, when are they, when do they need an update? When do we recognize that we will need to further develop them? And um, I hope that uh, the tools that we are in, uh, the, that we are developing in our projects and that the JRC is developing are helping teachers to find out when they uh, might want to update their digital competences and where they can find uh, the appropriate resources for this. And Jochen, uh, the, the other half of this question, you mentioned already a part of, uh, of it, uh, resources is what actually uh, are the biggest challenges now that you see because you've been leading a group of researchers and, and academics in higher education uh, in order to, uh, to go hand in hand with digital competence uh, framework and then maturity levels and then resource finding. What do you think is the biggest challenge uh, still existing? Well, from our interviews and for, from our experience, um, not many educators are aware of the existence of digital frameworks at all. So uh, those frameworks are, of, uh, are tremendously helpful, but if they're not known, then um, to, uh, not enough people uh, can uh, ex actually use them. And, um, and for, for, for us in Europe, um, as I mentioned, we are talking about open education resources and we need to acknowledge that for uh, the learning resource to be kept updated and to be man maintained, it needs some revenue source, be it uh, participation fees or be it public uh, funding, but it, it's not enough to just um, create an online course and then put it online and leave it for five years unchanged. It needs maintain maintenance. Thank you very much. And the final question, because we have only one minute left, goes to Nicole. Uh, the, the part of the question was already answered by you, Nicole, in your presentation, asked by Mark Kava, who asked, if pandemic assisted online teaching uh, or not and how it will remain. I think we saw it from your uh, final slides and statistics that it will increase. <laughs> but uh, the question that also comes from uh, Sandra, uh, how faculty management should get overview of digital competences of teachers, I think goes in line with the discussion that we have how management should ensure that digital competences do not expire? <laughs> that's a that's a very good question. And I think right now, too, there, especially we see in Canada and the US, a bit of tension right now between administration and faculty, as you know, there's you know, there's an equal interest in moving forward with flexible learning and incorporating more digital, but how that gets done and whether instructors can have that uh, autonomy over their own practices um, and to what extent does administration intervene is a bit of a touchy subject, I've certainly found. Um, with that said, I think that, uh, Sandra, what you ask is a really good question because how, how do um, administrators, faculty management get a sense of what's happening? And I think it's providing those professional uh, development opportunities for faculty to show up and perhaps asking in that context of what would be most helpful to you um, to get a sense of maybe where they're wanting the skills. But then I also think there's um, the, you know, regularly surveying faculty is a good sense um, with the caveat that they're already overloaded. So short, 
short surveys are effective in that. Also using um, directors of teaching and learning centers and creating communities of practice. I think especially as we get to a learning context that's becoming more and more decentralized, you'll have more people working from home, working in different environments. The concept of community comes in so much more and that uh, there's a climate where people are encouraged to work together where it's okay for someone to say, hey, I, I really don't know how to do this. Could somebody help me? I think that's going to lead to an environment where administrators and management can get a sense of you know, where faculty need additional support going forward. Thank you very much for all the panel speakers, uh, for you, Nicole, for Anastasia, for Yasmin, for Stefano, and for Jochen, very much for your contributions. Thank you for all participants. I'm sorry not to have time to ask each of you what was the takeaway from this webinar. But for me, that was definitely that we have to come to measure our competences in terms of knowledge, skills, attitudes, responsibilities, that we should share, that we should grow together, share together. And we are looking forward for supportive tools to motivate our teachers to self-assess, to find resources, to identify the maturity level of their digital competences and to try to be uh, together in this storm in the pandemic. We will have our next uh, uh, session in Eden annual conference taking place on the 21st, 24th of um, June. Those of you who do not know about the conference, please visit Eden website. And I hope that we will meet you there. In the meantime, thank you very much for all attendees, for the panelists, for your support and interest in digitally competent educator frameworks and models. Thank you and bye-bye.